I know you, the men and women of the Boston Fire Department, take your job of protecting the people of Boston very seriously. It is our job to protect you. Your safety is one of our top concerns. If you are injured or trapped in a fire, it is your duty to call a May Day. This video will highlight the appropriate way to call a May Day, the Boston Fire Department's standard operating procedures once a May Day was called, and a discussion about the importance of calling a May Day. The people of Boston need you safe and healthy to protect them from the next fire. I hope this instructional video is beneficial to you. Thank you and stay safe. Fire alarm, ladder six. Ladder six. Sub Ashmore Street, that we have heavy fire showing from the second floor windows to Bravo's side, three story wood frame occupied building. Ladder six will be command. The ladder six is going into fast forward attack. Ladder 6, your report on box 2461. You have heavy fire showing from windows on floor number 2 on the Bravo side. Ladder 6, you're establishing command and going into a fast attack mode. The building is a three story wood frame occupied, 1326. Ladder 23 is on Ashmont Street. Ladder 23 is Ashmont Street, come in. Ladder 23 on Ashmont Street, assuming Ashmont Street command. Fire ground frequency is channel 3, 1327. Ladder 6 is calling Ashmont Street command. Command's answering. Be advised, Ladder 6, stage 16, are on the second floor. We have a heavy fire condition. And the PS fire starts at the third floor. Ladder 23 has that. Ladder 23 to ladder 6, be advised, engine 24, ladder 23, you're advancing lines to the third floor. Ladder 6 has that. 16, go ahead with the water. Yeah, I'll take it to the next. Uh, we have heavy fire conditions for two, travel number three. Okay, 9-9, you're orders to Chief Mitchell, strike a second alarm box 2461, operator Y, 1329-9, you're reporting heavy fire condition on floor two, extending to floor number three on the Bravo side, 1329. Okay, 9-9, you're orders to Chief Mitchell, strike a second alarm box 2461, operator Y, 1329-9, you're reporting heavy fire condition on floor two, extending to floor number three on the Bravo side, 1329. John is calling Ashmont Command. Be advised, your RID team will be Engine 3, Ladder 4, District 8. Charlie, I'm going to do a 360 of the building, and I'll be right back. Right, well, I got my aid doing a 360 if you want to hear what he is. Okay. Yeah, yeah throw a ground ladder. ladder and then, uh, which side was it? B. B side? Yeah. Okay, write this down, Paul. Charlie, where are the companies? We've got 6 and 16, floor 2. Building 4, 23, floor 3. Your rig companies are engine 3, a lot of back up floor 2. That should be your five company. The rest is going to be the temporary rig company. C7 of fire alarm, C7 assuming Ashmont Command, CAR 9 is going to be interior operations and form all companies inside to communicate through CAR 9. C7 here on Ashmont Street assuming command, all companies operating at 2461. CAR 9 is interior operations, communicate through interior operations. Classic group. Ladder 6, do you need the roof? Uh, ladder 6, yes, sir, Ladder 6, roof. Yeah, open the roof to the rear. Open the roof to the rear. Full ladder to this side. Okay. Ladder 6, roof to command. Command in for Ladder 6, roof. We have a rubber roof and we are opening towards the rear. Command has a, keep me 
are formed if the flames get into the underneath the rubber roof. Let me know as soon as possible. Operation. This team is in place. I'm sending Rescue One up to uh, use the mission unit. All right, Operation. So now send them to floor three to assist up there. We've got two lines operating on floor two. Circuits are underway, and uh, I believe the same is happening up on floor three. Ladder 6, roof to command. And the fire alarm update on the fire. Heavy fire on the second and third floor. Two lines run on the second, one on the third. Primary search being conducted on the second and third floors. Which teams are in place. C7, your report on blocks 2461. You have heavy fire on floors 2 and 3 of a three story wood frame. Two lines running operating on floor 2, one line operating on floor 3. The RIT teams are in place, all companies work. Ladder 6, roof to command. Command answer and roof sector. Fire is underneath the roof, the rubber roof. Command has that. Get off the roof and uh, but stay on the ladder and update me on the condition of the roof. The roof sector has that. Command to operations. The roof is vented, but the fire appears to have gotten underneath the rubber roof and is extending across the roof. The operation says that uh got the map maybe a solid ladder. Coming on the second. We should have them here shortly. Okay, Demet. Give me the fire alarm. Now the first alarm on the the first engine on the second alarm. Report to me and be prepared to run uh, an engine three quarter over the last six scenario. Hey, command, you want the first two engines on the second alarm to run an inch and three quarter line over the last six's uh, aerial. 1334. Four. Operating at block 2461, maintain radio silence and standby for Mayday transmission. Lada 23 is reporting a Mayday on floor number 3 in the rear. Partial collapse, members of engine 24 are trapped. That's one command to final up. Initiate Mayday response and assign me a fire ground channel. The risk stay on channel 3 and operation switch to channel 4. Attention all companies operating at box 2461 and Mayday has been declared. RID operations are operating on channel 3. All other companies at 2461 switch now to channel 4. Channel 4 will be the fire ground frequency at 2461. Operations. Have that second line go up to the third floor. I'm sending ladder four in to assist in mid operations. Engine three will run a line to the second floor to replace the one moving to the third. Companies operating at blocks 2461 and Mayday has been declared for floor number three, the Charlie side, for members of engine 24. All companies operating at 2461 switch now to channel four. Channel four is the fire ground frequency. Rick companies operate on channel three. Rick companies only on channel three for command that has been simulcast on both frequencies. Chief, uh, have a lot of 23 actors, RIT operations while you maintain command of the RIT sector. Okay, RIT Sector Chief, how's that? Success to Chief, a lot of 23. A lot of 23 after that. A 
Mark 23, you'll be in charge upstairs and I'll be communicating with you. Mark 23 is in operation. Mark 23 to ready. We've recovered one member of engine 24. Mark 23 is bringing them down now. We're in the process of getting all members out of the debris. Okay, Grid 8 has that. You're in the process of uh, extricating three firemen that are entangled. Grid Chief Carr is answering the company. Advise your additional RIT team will be engine 21 to ladder 16 with rescue 2. The EMS has been notified to send additional ALS resources. You also have H2 and W12 responding to the bus. Ashland Command has that. In operation to RIT 8. RIT 8, RIT 8 to enter in operation. Gary, you're on Ashmont Street 1330. Your RIT companies are engine 3 and ladder 4. 700, go ahead, operation. Operation Scoop has passed. Okay, that operation has passed. All right, all right, we have, guys. We have. Communicate through interior operations at 2461, 1331. C7, your report on blocks 2461. You have heavy fire floors 2 and 3 of a three story wood frame. Two lines running operating on floor two, one line operating on floor three. The RIT teams are in place, all companies work. Okay, command, you want the first two engines and the second alarm to run an inch and three-quarter line over ladder six's uh, aerial. The command, that's going to be engine 14, okay? Command answer in RIT operation. Command, the three trap members have been extricated. They're out of the building and all RIT companies have been accounted for. Companies at box 2461, upon your exiting of the building, report to the accountability officer who is C700. So all companies, upon their exiting the building at 2461, report to the accountability officer who is C700, 1344. It was on May 13th, uh, 1995, uh, about 4.49 in the morning. When we pulled up to the incident, all we could see is a, a big wall of fire in the rear. And um, we knew we had a, a going on in hands at that point. And two of us stayed together. Another guy went into another room to search. Uh, he found two people. 
uh, that were kind of panicked and not sure what to do. So yelled for help. Myself and uh, another firefighter grabbed the two people, assisted them down from the third floor um, to the front porch. And um, I'm missing one of my members, the, the initial member that found the, per the people originally. I'm saying to myself, do I change my bottle now? And if he's in trouble, I don't have time to do that, so I better get back in there. So he had maybe 10 or 15 minutes left on it. He's with my crew. You take great sense of pride in having your crew with you at all times. And when one's missing, you kind of, it's like the end of the world to you. So I went up to uh, what I thought was the second floor. It was actually the third floor, and I was yelling for him. In the process, unbeknownst to me, he had gotten out a window. The rescue company had thrown a ladder to the outside of the building. So now that tells me I got maybe five minutes tops of air left before I run out of air myself. So I'm still searching for him. Now I'm concerned because I know I'm low on air and conditions are getting worse and I can't see a hand in front of me. So now I'm really frantically searching for a way out. I don't see any windows that are available. I'm looking for door entrances. I'm running into closets. I'm running into toilets. At that point in time, I'm saying to myself, I'm going to find a way out. I'll get out of this. I said, before that happens, I better call down to the incident commander. And I, uh, I said, I, I need help. Uh, and he, he misinterpreted it as I needed help in the form of a hose line or a, uh, a ladder. But it was actually my personal being that needed help. Luckily, uh, one of my former classmates that I came on with the job with back in 1986, he uh, heard the transmission on the radio. He called fire alarm and said, you have a member in trouble up there? By the tone of his voice, I could tell you better get help up to him. So they notified the incident commander. In the meantime, I'm frantically still trying to search for a way out. And at that point, uh, the vibro alert went off the second time, which signifies that I'm totally out of air. That being the case, I, I took the mask off and got to as low as the ground as I could possibly get because that's where your cleanest air is. But unfortunately, in this condition, there was no clean air to be had. And all I got was a few gulpfuls of like really bad, bad superheated gases. So I'm saying to myself, um, I can't believe I'm going to buy it in a three and a half story residential building. Um, I'm at the end of the line. Um, I'm flashing back to my whole life. I'm thinking about my wife. I'm thinking about my uh, two boys. And my wife was pregnant at the time. She was six months pregnant with my third child. And I said, I'm going to leave all this behind. And how are they going to cope? I thought of my sister, who 10 days earlier had succumbed to cancer. And I, I really, really, to this day, think that uh, there was divine intervention. And she saw the danger that I, I was in. And she said, it's not your time. I said, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go down swinging. So uh, I, I, I stood up. Um, I yelled as hard as I could, help me. I need help. And uh, it really surprised me how loud I yelled it. And luckily, the tower company at this point w was sent in by the incident commander to search for me. They heard this yelling and screaming, and they went to me. And I went unconscious. They grabbed me to, to get me out of there. I'm banging down the stairs. They got me out of there. They got me into a clean environment. Uh, I'm going in and out at this time. Uh, I remember being wheeled right across the street to Brigham and Women's Intensive Care, which saved my life. I was about 30 seconds away from losing my life, basically. That's what the doctor told me. And thank God that I have strong lungs to yell, and thank God that the tower company was there in the right time. And I think, thank God, that my sister was looking down on me. Well, it was in uh, 1997. Uh, it was it was a nighttime. Box 2164, Quincy and Warren, for a building fire on Hazelwood Street. Um, we started into that fire. We got there first, a rescue company, with no water and no ladders. As soon as we got right in front of the building, I remember John saying that um, we got smoke showing. I looked over. I said, No, we got heavy smoke showing. <laughs> My recollection, I was uh, I was. New on the job, about almost four years. I'm working for a seasoned crew, and 
I was very eager. I came to the front door, and, and two or three people emerged from uh, the front door with smoke down to here. And it was one person, second person, and then a, a guy, he grabbed me and said, my wife's upstairs, with the look of death in his eyes. I looked and I saw a red glow toward the back, and the smoke was banked down to here. My thought was I had one chance to run up the stairs, hook my foot on the top uh, step, and do a sweep to see if she had collapsed right there and, and get down. In, this, in the few seconds that Paul was behind me, uh, the conditions rapidly deteriorated. And I tried to ask the guy exactly what room she was in so I, we could go up and go exactly to where she was and get out of there. Didn't have time for an answer. He was, he was in shock, couldn't communicate really well. And my thought was, John's up there, I've got to get up there. As I went in the front door, there was a, a long hallway leading to the back of the building and the fire was coming down the hallway. And I just looked up and I can't say on camera what I was thinking <laughs> or what I might have said. As I got to the stop top of the stairs, I remember just calling out, calling out for him. Heat was, it was really, really, really hot. And fortunately for us, which I found out later, uh, another firefighter, Francis Baxter, who's a very seasoned guy, couldn't get in the front door because at that point the fire had completely taken hold of the of the, the front door and he he was able to reach in under the fire with a rake and pull a a French door closed which which slowed the fire's progress up to us but then at that point we were effectively trapped no other way down because the, the house was firebombed from the rear my first thought was to let the chief know where we were he wasn't even there yet I knew he wasn't there yet so I got on the radio and I, what I said to him was uh, Rescue 200 to Car 9. He says, you have two members of Rescue 2 on the second floor. We're conducting a search. We've encountered a high heat and zero visibility and we need a big line to the second floor. That was that. And uh, I remember yelling to John constantly. We still talk about this to this day. Don't break the windows. Don't break any windows because um, you break the windows, it's going to come and get you. And we, we had no way to defend ourselves. The only thing that we had to defend ourselves with was our wits. And then a uh, fire alarm came on the air. I believe it was Barry Staff. He said, Rescue 200, are you trapped? And my answer to him was no, but we need a big line to the second floor. And, and we were trapped. Um, there were no May Day procedures in place then. We, or PARs. Or PARs, uh, you yeah. I remember, I remember them. Uh, I remember Paul working his way to the front of the of the second floor, and I noticed his entire front was illuminated in orange. And I said, "Well, why is Paul all orange, and why can I see that?" Because uh, he was standing at the front windows, and the fire was coming out of the front windows and the front door, lapping up, and it was illuminating and bouncing off him. So, had those windows failed, all that fire would have came in on us. I remember standing in that window, looking down and seeing. The front door was, I was right above the front door and it was just blowing out. And the guys, engine 24 and engine 42, they told us that they couldn't believe that we stayed up. We survived that because it was... Oh, you got burnt, right? Yeah, I got burnt. I got burnt. Engine 42. Engine 42 pushed the big line into the front, front doorway and the heat subsided where we were. And as uh, soon as that happened, I, I remember saying, John, let's go, let's, let's go. But there, there were factors that led to us still being here. And, and I think one was that every window on that second floor, looking back on it, every window on that second floor had to be shut, had to be. Because if one of them was open, it would have rolled right in on us. And if it had, a, it would have flashed. A lot of things led to our survival. A lot, one thing with Franny Baxter. And, and now uh, we have Mayday. Mayday's pars. So if we found ourselves in that situation again, we would certainly oh. utilize, uh, utilize no uh, question. Mayday procedures. Let's see, it was about two, two and a half years ago, we responded to Harrisharf Street. We came in from what they call the Delta side, which would be the right side of the building. And uh, it looked to me as the whole attic was involved on that side. Uh, tried to do a quick 360. The left-hand side or the Bravo side was not fully involved yet. Companies had stretched in. Then it turned to hell. I uh, started getting radio reports of uh, uh, they were getting overwhelmed up there. I told everybody to back out. And somewhere in that point, I got a message from Ladder 4, Roofman saying he needed a ladder. And I believe my reply was, don't go on the roof, it's too dangerous. And I moved on.
I ordered the two trucks coming in a second to bring ladders with them. One of them I asked me where they wanted the ladder, I said throw it over on the Bravo side and they just about hit the guys in the feet I guess. Uh, I forget how long after, I was doing some training with another chief and he said to me, those guys were in trouble. And I said, no they weren't, they just wanted a ladder. And I went back and listened and I guess they call it the aha moments or the oh wow moments or whatever you want. But uh, once you know afterwards what had happened, uh, it just, you know, you have a little trouble breathing. And then I come to find out even later, one of the guys was supposedly lying on the floor waiting to die because it was so hot in there and couldn't find his way out. And his partner shined the light in and said, and then they were hanging by their fingertips on the roof. So, I mean, I, I don't know what it takes to give a mayday on this job, but that fire certainly seemed to have all of the indicators that you would want. I need some help. I just thought I need a ladder. Mayday, mayday, mayday. I need a ladder and we will get you what you need. But guys would rather die in a building than give a mayday. I don't know why. The bottom line is, do you want to be alive? That's the answer right there. Do you want to see tomorrow? Do you want to see your family? I mean, to me, it's a no-brainer, you know, and it shouldn't be. Uh, it's just macho. It's just people, we've never done it before. Why do you expect us to do it now? And uh, I don't know how we change that attitude. I'm hoping that this film may have some effect with that. Guys might say, well, geez, he's got a point. I want to go see my family again. I want to be, I want to go home at the end of my tour. My goal now is everybody goes home at the end of the tours. If I can make that happen, then I've had a good day. Well, the Mayday does several things. First, it stops all unnecessary radio communication so we can dedicate the radio channels to the people that need assistance and also to the team that's going to go and recover that person. And it also is important because it gives us an idea of the location of the individual and a place to start rather than just that person declaring a Mayday we should get some communication from him and the channels will be clear. There's basically three types of communication, what they call routine, which is what it sounded like to me. We need help up here, we need another line, we need a ladder, whatever it may be. There are urgent communications which step up above, you know, urgent, whatever the, the, the thing may be. There's no back stairs, the porches are collapsed or whatever. And Mayday says, I'm in trouble and I need you to come get me now. So that has the highest urgency of all. And uh, if I hear that, then we have a whole routine that we're going to go into and try to find that person. If firefighters use tools, they, we have a lot of tools to uh, use, and we're trained on tools, with tools. And the May Day is another tool. It's a tool that uh, will save your life and save other firefighters' lives. So it's one of the tools that it's a, a very, very important tool to use. And I think every firefighter out there should um, know how to use this tool and also uh, do not be afraid to use this tool. It's um, designed to save their life. Lack of calling a mayday in a timely manner really affects the firefighting operations. It can cause the firefighting operations to actually slow down and if you wait too long to call a mayday it puts other people's lives in jeopardy because more risk now has to be taken by the firefighters on scene. The firefighters are, it's the macho image where if you call a mayday um, they're going to go back to the firehouse and all in front of course and, and, and get uh, razzed. They feel like they'd be picked on, but I'd rather be picked on than having a funeral five days later and having their wife and kids not having their father or mother around for the rest of their lives. Memorial Hall is a wall that I know everybody on there. And if you went to each fire where they, those guys died, there's either a brand new building there or a completely rehab building or whatever, which means if we burnt it right down into the basement, the next day they'll come out with the cranes, they'll tear all the junk out, and they'll start rebuilding that building again. But those guys are going to be dead forever. Call it. Call it early and call it often, because it's your life. And you have an obligation to serve the citizens of Boston and to serve yourself and your family. You have an obligation to your family to call home in one piece. I want to thank everybody that was involved in the making of this video, especially the people that have described why a Mayday and when they were involved in a Mayday situation. And I'd like all firefighters to realize that this is something that is very important and could save their lives.